Making armor. Sounds like the kind of thing the average guy might not be able to do. Because, well, don't you need to be trained? Don't you need certain tools and a forge? Well, I want you to know that you can do this if you have a real interest. Armor making should be accessible and feasible. But, you know, just like about anything, it takes dedication. It shouldn't be so intimidating that you never try, though. Just like any craft that you learn, proficiency comes with time and practice. So you shouldn't expect to be able to create something fit for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You know, personally, my aim is to create something that's functional and something that fits me as well. Beyond that, if possible, I want to make armor that looks correct and is specific to a certain period and something that I can be proud of. So what about the required tools? If I was going to give it a shot at making a helm and I've never done any armoring before, what are the basic tools required? What if I can't get them? Are there any suitable alternatives? Believe me, those were exactly the kinds of questions that I had when I first started trying to make armor. So I will answer all those questions in a separate upload. The surviving great helm seen here dates from the end of the 13th century to the beginning of the 14th century. It's believed to be of German make and it's located currently at the National Museum of Castel Sant'Angelo. We are going to do our best to reproduce this armor. I think it's a good starting point because of its simplicity. There are a limited number of plates needed for this design, just five, and I think it's a perfect starting place for a beginner. Now it would be ideal if we could handle the object in person and make measurements and tracings and take our own photographs, uh, but we're not that fortunate so we're going to have to rely on the available images. I couldn't find too many pictures of this particular helm, but here are two more. You'll notice odd holes positioned near the crown, here. These would have been made so that a crest could be added to the top of the helm. The base of the crest, once it's added, would have appeared something like this. Compare the Bolzano helm, as it's often referred to, to another helm, possibly from the same workshop. It appears to have the same number of rivets and the same general shape and breadths. And uh, near the crown, holes have been fashioned exactly like the Bolzano helm. You'll also see some small holes that encircle the helm, and these permitted a liner to be laced securely inside. So what we're going to need is a good pattern. Because it's not possible to make measurements of the artifact, it's helpful to have as many similar examples of helms that date roughly to the same period when constructing the helm pattern. The pattern itself is done mostly by trial and error. Usually I cut out cardstock or thick paper. It takes several times to get it right. I glue these pieces together and then I end up disassembling them, making alterations, and with new cardstock, um, you know, doing this as many times as it takes uh, to obtain a paper helmet that I can refer to. It's uh, gonna be something that fits on my head so, I mean, that's one of the reasons you want a three-dimensional pattern. You don't want to create uh, this helmet that you've never actually put on your head before. So the uh, pattern is sort of a substitute. And then, of course, I'm constantly going back uh, with the paper helm um, and comparing those to the pieces that I'm shaping with a hammer to make sure that they resemble each other. This time, in fact, I got lucky, I guess, and I only had to make one pattern without any alterations. But uh, usually it takes at least two tries to get it right. The steel I'm using is 16 gauge. I know it's become unfashionable to use the archaic term gauge these days, but you know, that's how it's sold in stores in the US. And uh, so it's, it's hard to break old habits. Uh, that's about 1 16th of an inch or 1.58 millimeters. You could use thicker metal if you wanted to. I mean, you could use uh, 14 gauge, that would be quite a bit thicker. 12 gauge, that's probably excessive. The thicker the helm is, the more difficult it's gonna be for you to shape it. And at a certain point, you probably need to actually use heat. Uh, with 16 gauge, we can do this uh, cold hammered. We don't have to heat it up in a forge. Uh, it still will become hammer hardened uh, as we beat the metal into shape. Um, it just, that's just what happens. It becomes harder and harder uh, as you work certain areas. Now that's going to happen more with uh, something that you have to raise. And in another video, I'll show you sort of different techniques 
Um, this helmet is so simple, there's not a lot of techniques that we're going to be using. So we're going to take the pattern, place it on the metal, trying to conserve as much metal as possible. We don't want to be wasteful. And then we're going to trace the pattern with the Sharpie, and then we'll need to cut them out. There's quite a few different ways to cut out the uh, patterns, the shapes. Like for example, you could use like a scroll saw. When I first got started, I didn't really have anything to cut these out. I used uh, metal shears, and um, these metal shears, they will just leave your hand in so much pain. Sometimes they're called aviation snips, and uh, they're okay. I mean, they will cut through this gauge, 16 gauge. Um, I think the ones that cut through 16 gauge have a red handle, uh, at least the ones that are made by Wiss or Weiss. And uh, they work, but you know, sometimes I was making a project that had 10 or 20 plates in it, and it would literally take maybe 24 hours to cut these out. Each, each one of these plates uh, could take an hour or more, and um, it seems crazy, but it, you know, it would take days to cut out the pieces necessary for the project. So it would, you know, it would take such a long time, and after day two or day three, my hands would be aching. And so eventually I did uh, get a hold of this B1 Beverly Shear. And Beverly Shears come in three different sizes, B1, B2, and B3. But if you look them up, you'll find that they're pretty expensive. Um, and so maybe the B1 is within reach, but maybe not. In any case, uh, there's many ways to get this cut out. You could use an angle grinder uh, with a, a blade that can cut through metal. One thing you definitely want to make sure, and I cannot stress this enough, is to wear protection. For your ears, if you're using any sort of power tool, and for your eyes, always wear, uh, you know, if you wear glasses, that should work, but wear protective eyewear, definitely. One thing that's nice about this throatless shear is that it can cut angles, so as you push the metal through the shears, uh, you're able to turn it at the same time, so you are able to cut some interesting shapes. Now you want to make sure you're not getting too close to your lines. And another thing that you'd want to be aware of, you may want to leave a margin for error in the area around the eyes. Uh, this area is going to be stressed to a great degree if you're hammering it directly. Anytime you've got um, some angles that are, that are cut out in the metal, if you strike them directly with a hammer, uh, repeatedly you probably will have the metal crack and that can be sort of heartbreaking especially if you've worked on something for a long time. There are ways to try to fix that issue uh, with a file and try to remove the crack uh, as best as possible. As it develops though it, it can spread and um, it sort of surprised me the first time that that happened on a helm that I was building so just be aware of that. You may also notice that I'm wearing white gloves here, and there's a reason for that. It's not to avoid, you know, smudging the metal and, and causing rust to form here. It's actually because the edges are just so sharp. Even when you buy a new piece of steel, it's going to have some edges that can do some damage to your hands. And I've definitely cut myself just handling the piece that I've purchased. So I wear gloves all the time uh, when I'm holding the metal. Generally when I'm hammering, the hand that holds the hammer uh, does not have a glove on it so I can grip the hammer, but my left hand, which is the hand that I hold the piece in, that's always got a glove on uh, to protect my fingers and my hand. It also s absorbs some of the shock from the hammer, and uh, you'll find that's really useful. Occasionally I'll even put a piece of leather between the piece I'm working and my gloved hand. So just to have a little bit of extra cushion uh, to keep the vibration from really causing a lot of pain in my hand. When you're hammering for hours, you will find that you know it, it does take a toll on your body, on your elbow, possibly um, in your wrist, your arm. You're gonna feel that. So you know it might be a good workout too. Another thing to mention here in terms of safety are the scraps that might result. Uh, so these pieces are so sharp and definitely want to clean them up right away. 
If there are any larger scraps, you may want to keep those. Uh, maybe throw those into a cardboard box, a thick cardboard box, so that they don't uh, spill out or, you know, cause any injury later. But the reason why these scraps might work out for you well in the future is that they can be made into washers and, um, and they're just going to be really useful. After everything's cut out, we will need to remove the burrs, and so I'm going to use a bench grinder to do that. It's not just burrs that need to be removed though. The bench grinder will help me shape the pieces a little bit better. So I've left a little bit of space on each one. Uh, some pieces have more that needs to be removed, some have less. But we'll use the bench grinder to really make these a little more precise and line up with our patterns uh, quite a bit better. Some of the more delicate pieces like the nasal guard piece um, really need to be shaped with more precision. So you can use a bench grinder, you could use a file or a rasp. And those are going to take you a lot longer but they'll give you the same result. We're going to start with the front of the helmet. I'm going to call it the mask, that's the lower piece, and the brow, that's the higher piece. I'm actually going to start with the brow. I feel like if I start with the brow, I'll have a good idea about how this is all going to be coming together. It's not the first thing that we would rivet together. I'll show you exactly how I rivet it later on, but uh, it's definitely the first piece I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with this crease down the center, sort of a medial line uh, ridge there and I'll use the anvil to create that ridge. Um, when I start off, I'm just gonna be hammering it uh, in such a way that I'm causing that crease to form. And I work the front and the back of the helm. So I should say the front and the inside or the outer side and the inner side. When you start hammering, you know, you're hammering it flat. You're trying to cause that crease to form and one of the things that's so important and might get overlooked if this is the first time you're trying to hammer is that you need to have really good light. The light reflects off the metal and every time you strike the, the metal, the light changes on the metal a little differently. It's reflected differently. So basically, in other words, you can see where you've hammered it if you have really good light. Um, this might be a reason why you may want to try this outside. Um, but knowing where you're striking it is extremely important, as you can imagine. As you watch this at high speed, you can really see it start to form. And uh, I'm paying really close attention to how the light's hitting it. And the way that we will move the metal, and it really is moving the metal. We're not just bending it, we're moving the, the metal. So that's important because there are several different hammers that I'm using here. Some are intended to just shape the metal, to push it out of the way. Uh, the larger one that I have uh, has two faces. One of them is rounded, the other one is completely flat. And it generally will spread the metal out. So it'll thin the metal as it's spreading it out. It'll also flatten it a little bit. Every hammer that we use generally will leave a mark in the metal, except for the dead blow hammer. That's the big black, it's like a rubber, some sort of, uh, I don't know what it's made out of, maybe vinyl or something like that, but um, that is a hammer that I'll use probably a lot for the back of the helmet because we don't want to leave too many marks back there. There's really no point because we may have to planish all of these spots, you know, these marks out. And I haven't decided how much planishing I'm going to do. Some helmets were actually left in a uh, hammered state. That would be sort of like a munitions grade. But often, especially as we move through the Middle Ages and the uh, armor becomes finer, uh, all of those marks are going to be hammered out in the nicest pieces. You'll, you know, you'll, you're obviously probably accustomed to Maximilian style and uh, you know Gothic styles where uh, the lines are just very beautiful. You don't see any hammer marks, and you can tell that planishing has been done. That is the step where you remove all of the hammer marks. I haven't decided whether or not I'm gonna do that. I can tell you that as you start to work the piece and as it collects thousands of little marks, sometimes you might get discouraged because you're looking at this piece and it just looks like 
total trash. I mean, it looks like it's literally like a misformed trash can. But I don't want you to get discouraged at that point if you're trying this project because everything I've created it looks like that at one stage or another. So, you know, just keep working through it. I can shape the nasal guard a little bit because it does have to be moved down sort of back uh, so it can attach to the helmet, the brow portion of the helmet. These are all stakes. They fit in the hardy hole there in my anvil. So I'm using this two inch mushroom stake. Uh, that's what it's called. I'll constantly refer back to the paper helmet to make sure that the um, the angles are correct, or at least that they're getting to be correct. And uh, sometimes, you know, I might even have to make alterations like uh, I could take a piece of metal that I realize maybe it's too long on one side or both sides, and I could make some small corrections and cut a little bit off, um, maybe grind a little part if necessary. And so, always going back to that paper pattern to make sure that it's coming along. You know, it, if you were never to look at anything and you just had it in your mind what it's supposed to look like, it probably wouldn't look perfect when you're done. Um, so I refer to this helmet, I refer to any images that I might have of what I want it to look like, and um, it's not something that you have to remember what it looks like. I would constantly refer to these things to make sure that I'm on track. Both the brow and the mask are pretty much flat. They're very flat here. Uh, unlike the last helm that I built, which was sort of like a wastebasket shape, um, this one is very flat, so I'm using the face of the anvil a lot. The back of the helmet, though, is not so flat. So I use this stake. It's like a tinsmith stake, and I can uh, bend it more into like a barrel shape. In terms of when I start putting the helmet together, I feel like as soon as the pieces start to fit, even though they're not fully in the right shape, it might be a good idea to put a few holes and not actually rivets, but simply um, like machine screws, uh, washers on the back and nuts on the front. And that will allow you to take the helmet apart, put it back together repeatedly as you shape each piece. And it's just a really good idea. You can see how the piece is coming together as a whole. And so I'm starting by putting uh, just one single hole at the top of the nasal guard. The Sharpies pretty much come off several times on the breath holes on the uh, front of the mask. So instead of just continuing to redraw those lines, I'm going to actually use a Dremel tool and draw those into the metal. And that way we don't have to worry about redrawing them. I know where they are and I will cut them out later. If I had a die, it would be wonderful if I had that exact shape as like a punch and die set, but I don't. I'll show you later how I'm going to cut those out, probably going to rely extensively on, on files. And traditionally this was probably mostly done with a file, so that works just fine. After all the breaths are drawn on with a Dremel, we can remove the marks that were made by the Sharpie pen. So I, I start with these sanding blocks. Um, probably don't want to use anything too rough because it you might actually leave um, scratches. So I usually start with like a medium block and uh, you know you could go all the way to fine but there's still that question of whether or not we're going to planish all these dents out. So it's really not necessary to uh, create a, a finely polished piece because there's all these dents that are still remaining in the metal and uh, we may choose to knock these out, uh, literally. So uh, this is how far we got today and I didn't want to make this video extremely long um, so we're going to stop here and I will have the rest of the upload done pretty quickly here. Um, we're going to actually put together the liner, I'll show you how to do that, as well as the crest. I think it would be great to have that on top, it sort of just makes it really special to have that and I'll show you how I make that. So thanks for watching today. I'll talk to you later.